Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory! In the third and final episode of our short little foray into investigative journalism. Thanks for sticking with it. I know that this one was a bit of a departure for the channel, but honestly, this was a personal passion project for me. After watching Shane's series on Jake, there were three main topics that I wanted to address. First, as a creator on this platform for a huge chunk of my life, I wanted to explore the ulterior motives behind this new generation of YouTuber, and the way that they and the corporations oftentimes fund them can be exploiting audience trust. Second, as a father and advocate for child education, I wanted to raise awareness of the manipulation inherent in advertising to kids and why it's so easy to do, whether it was intentional or not. And lastly, we come to today's episode, where, as a viewer, I wanted to take a step back and cover Shane's trend of docu-series in general, to raise awareness to him, and more importantly to you, about the dangerous tactics that storytellers can use to sway your opinions about the characters in their stories. Now, as I've done these last few episodes, I've seen a lot of comments from you all watching that reflected a lot of my own feelings when I was watching Shane's series on Jake for the first time. I kinda wish Shane didn't hold back. He was too empathetic. I love Shane, but sometimes his videos in this category aren't always revealing the entire truth, or that he's not going as in-depth as he could've when seeking the truth. He promoted this thing as nothing is off the table, but it was clear that some things were off the table. I personally wanted to see Jake Paul answer for things like his business decisions and his murder. But instead, it all just felt like one big redemption arc for him. Which raises the question, should Shane have covered all that business stuff? Does it matter that he didn't? And most importantly, are his docuseries actually dangerous because of the way he portrays the people in them? Almost as soon as the Jake Paul documentary started airing, Shane came under fire for giving Jake a platform, and then for cranking up the drama on his story by comparing him to sociopaths, and then by playing dramatic music and using editing tricks to emphasize specific moments, and finally for making making excuses for Jake's bad behavior by shifting blame to his parents and his brother. So was the internet right to be leveling criticisms at Shane? Today, we're gonna find out. Oh, and uh, in case you were sick of the guy, this theory isn't about Jake anymore. No, this time the whole bank of Shane documentaries are under my theoretical microscope. Ooh, I'm nervous. You probably should be. Or maybe not. The only way to find out is to dive in. The first, and perhaps biggest, complaint that Shane got in his coverage of Jake Paul was his use of music to overemphasize certain key moments early on in the series. Jake Paul might be a sociopath. He has a creepy dad. It felt, to many viewers, disingenuous, manipulative, and in response, it's something that Shane dialed back on as the series went on. But even shots like this, the final one of the series, in slow-mo with somber piano music playing underneath, is manipulative, turning a simple walk away from the camera into something much more, a deep, meaningful, reflective moment where Jake's fake persona is finally dropped. A moment that screams, this, this right here is the real Jake Paul. When Seriously, he was just walking away from the camera. All of these things, the horror stings, the glitches, the slow-mo shots, and sad music are all examples of the psychological principle known as priming. Just like you coat a wall with primer before laying down the paint so that the paint goes on smoother, you prime the audience so that they more easily accept what you're trying to convince them of. You know how you recognize that there's about to be a jump scare in a horror movie because you're entering a scary place? And then a door starts creaking open and the music changes. That's a form of priming. But it's not all about just music and editing. Everyone has made the joke that it takes a long time for a Shane docuseries to get started. All that time that Shane spends talking about how nervous he is and generally spending a lot of time self-deprecating in both this series and in the Jeffree Star series. But why? Why is he so nervous? No one talks about this, but Shane has a massive YouTube presence. He's one of the longest standing and best loved creators on the platform. He doesn't need to be nervous with anyone, and yet he portrays himself as being insecure in front of his subjects. Well, whether he means it or not, he's priming his audience to feel the same way he does, like he's entering the presence of someone much greater. If Shane Dawson approaches Jeffree Star or Jake Paul like a guy who looks up to him or just wants to impress him, well, it primes us as the audience to also think that those people are worthy of those emotions. His anticipation becomes our anticipation. He's the audience 
audience stand-in when what we're really seeing is just one massive online celebrity talking to yet another massive online celebrity. I mean, seriously Shane, you've been a YouTube star for over a decade, and have a house in a really upscale part of Los Angeles. You're a bigger deal than a bunch of your documentary subjects. I mean, sure, you might buy shirts at Target, but that's because Target just sells really good shirts. Anyway, both Shane and Jake also use lamp shading a lot throughout the series to get you thinking the way that they want you to be thinking. Basically, lamp shading is the technique of leveling criticism against yourself instead of waiting for people to use those criticisms against you. In the case of the Jake Paul docuseries, video one is dedicated to Shane acknowledging up front that people will hate him for doing the videos, that they'll unsubscribe, that they'll accuse him of giving Jake a platform. Shane, if you do this, we will unsubscribe. We don't want to be a part of this. I literally will stop watching Shane Dawson if he's going to try to sit here and make me feel bad for Jake Paul. And sure, some people did all of those things. But because Shane lampshaded us with those arguments, they immediately lost most of the power that they would have had if they had just come out of the blue. Jake Paul also lampshades in his opening call to Shane, saying that people hate him and that Shane will regret doing this. People hate me, like literally they hate me. And uh, I don't, if, if like this is going to hurt you, then, like, I don't want to do it. Acknowledging his own flaws, or at least that other people say that he has flaws, which in turn deprives the haters of all of their ammo. I mean, I myself lampshade all the time on this show. I lampshade that my jokes are bad, because they are all the time. It's time for your interview. <laughs> Uh, how about it's time to not have a cringy intro joke at the expense of Markiplier personalities? <laughs> and what that enables me to do is diffuse all comments about my cringy humor. Even me lampshading about my own lampshading is in and of itself lampshading. You can't hold it against me if I acknowledge it and move on, so let's move on. And then finally, there's framing. Framing is essentially how something is presented to the audience that influences the choices that people make about how to process that information. The biggest piece of framing in Shane's series is the entire discussion of sociopaths at the very beginning of the series. Just by asking the question, are Jake and Logan sociopaths, it frames every interaction and video clip that happens afterward in a way that makes you think, huh, maybe they are sociopaths. By saying this, and the more I realized and researched and the more I learned about sociopaths, and then showing this, where Logan goes from pretending to be nervous to not, a big scene in my first big Hollywood movie. And I just wanted, I'm just, yo, <laughs> I'm just kidding, y'all freaking hell! Suddenly, it's no longer simply just someone putting on a show for the camera, but rather it's implicitly saying, wow, this person must have a facade, a lack of emotion. It must be evidence of sociopathy. Mentioning the word sociopath and using this treatment He is a sociopath is a lot different than using this treatment. He is a sociopath. And again, let me lampshade here. I know this because I do it all the time. This kind of framing happens over and over, along with priming to paint a picture of people who can't speak for themselves. Before seeing any footage of Jake's dad, we're prefaced with the fact that Shane and his team have heard that he's weird. I've this? heard weird things about the dad, but I've never I've definitely seen. heard stuff, yeah. And okay, sure, he's definitely weird, but Shane sets us up to already have these preconceived notions about characters around Jake Paul based on the way that he himself has talked about them in advance. One one of the biggest framing decisions that any filmmaker has is how to end his movie. Shane could have ended his docuseries in any way that he wanted, like say with Jake's ex-girlfriend Alyssa Violet, a moment that, as I understand it, chronologically seemed to be one of the last things that he shot. That would leave a very different impression on the overall narrative arc of the story than ending on that slow-mo sad piano shot. <laughs> And sure, that's a big decision, but even the smallest of things are subject to framing. Look at this. Shane, late night, kitchen, ripped pajamas, getting himself a Diet Coke. Excellent choice of drink, by the way. This shot seems like it does nothing, but in reality, why it's there is because it's framing what comes next. An update, and also a disclaimer, and also an apology. That's a lot. <laughs> it rolls directly into him addressing the early criticisms of the audience leveled against the first parts of the series. This scene makes him sympathetic downtrodden and relatable. He's been up all night. He drinks Diet Coke and has ripped pajamas just like us. This apology would look and feel very differently if it was framed, like say, in the vestibule of your mansion with your Jeep out front. <sighs> I think that's what my, and many other viewers' biggest issue was with Shane's docuseries. That it was meant to be an honest tell-all about this controversial figure. I want to really be honest about it and investigate. 
you. But in the end, it came off as biased in Jake's favor. And honestly, that makes sense, right? Controversial figures aren't gonna just agree to do expose videos on themselves. To get the level of access that Shane does, the subject matter of the videos needs to be confident that the story being told is gonna favor them. But that just wasn't how this thing was branded. And it wasn't just this one on Jake Paul either. How can you do an honest assessment of the hot mess that was TanaCon, searching for a person to pin the blame on, when Tana Mojo herself, who created the ill-fated event in the first place, was the one who accepted your Streamy award in your absence? So accepting the Streamy on his behalf is Tana Mojo. Gabby Hanna's reaction right there? Yeah. Hashtag relatable. It was mine too. The person who ripped off her fans and made them wait outside for multiple days and then got exposed by Shane? She's the one who's gonna accept his award? It's an odd choice. I think we all can agree this is the only time I'll ever be holding a Creator of the Year award. To be real here, you guys, I wouldn't even be doing anything if it wasn't for Shane. And, and then Shane tweets about her being family. I'm like, way too nice, way too forgiving, way too loyal. You can't do that, Shane. You're a doc documentarian. We need you to expose the unbiased truths. You are the arbiter of these facts, is what I thought. But in researching this episode, I learned that I was wrong, and I couldn't have been any more wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. When I, and I'm sure a lot of you, think about the term documentary, I think we all have a pretty clear image in our head of antelope running from lions in Africa, or a trip through the cosmos, or an informational doc about people like Jiro Dreams of Sushi or Exit Through the Gift Shop, all narrated by Morgan Freeman. I'm Morgan Freeman. Because it is always Morgan Freeman. We are all travelers on an unending voyage of discovery. Documentaries are the things my parents used to watch on the History Channel, and now Shane Dawson is doing a cool new take on them by fusing YouTube vlog style with investigative journalism. But here's the thing, documentaries aren't what you thought they were. There are a few really famous places that you can go to show off your documentary film skills, like the Cannes or Sundance Film Festivals. Both of them have entry definitions for their documentary film divisions that essentially boil down to the following five components. One, the use of artful film language and the ability to connect with an audience. Two, the use of effective storytelling. Three, originality. Four, cultural relevance. And finally, they have to inspire the audience to want to know more about their subject. And that's it. That's really the list for criteria for a documentary film. Do you notice anything? missing? Right away, there is nothing that says that documentaries have to be truthful. I mean, sure, it has to meet the dictionary definition of a documentary, which is a film about a real person or event, but there's nothing in these criteria about having to tell the whole story or portray your subject in a balanced way. All you have to do is talk about them. Documentaries are about being effective storytellers, not about being effective journalists. According to Bill Nichols, who is one of the world's top documentary scholars and theorists, I'm not making up his title, he is a genuine film theorist, the purpose of a documentary isn't to educate you, it's to persuade you. Nichols states that, quote, documentary films mount an effort to convince, persuade, or predispose us to a particular view of the world. It may entertain or please, but it does so in relation to rhetoric or persuasive effort aimed at the existing social world, end quote. All those documentaries about penguins on melting polar ice caps, what they're really doing is trying to persuade us to stop global warming. Those Neil deGrasse Tyson astronomy documentaries? Fund space research. Jiro dreams of sushi? Eat more sushi. And from the looks of it, Shane meets all of these criteria too. The TanaCon expose? Place blame and get attendees a refund. Interviewing Jeffree Star? Change the audience's minds about someone who had been branded a racist and dumb beauty influencer. Investigating Jake Paul? It's a bit unclear, but it ended up being rehabilitating his image and differentiating him from Logan. Shane's got himself three documentaries on his hands, just not documentaries in the way that I, and I think a lot of his audience, understood them. It's interesting. When you step back and look at this whole series, this whole three-part series I've done on film theory, it all boils down to one core theme, manipulation through the medium. In episodes one and two, I gave Jake a really hard time because he and his corporate backers are exploiting the inherent trust that comes from the medium of digital video. YouTube is different than movies and TV, at least for now. Viewers expect more authenticity from it because it is literally people holding a camera to their face. On YouTube, there's a perceived truthfulness that can lead people to believe creators don't have their own agenda when we've seen in the case of people like Jake that they most certainly do. The same can be said of Shane to a much different 
extent. We've just spent however many minutes long this video ends up being talking about how Shane's just produced a textbook documentary using persuasive techniques like framing and priming that any good storyteller uses. There is absolutely nothing wrong with it, except for the runtime, because seriously, buddy, just make some tough editing choices and trim down the whole thing for crying out loud. No, the problem is with us the viewer. If it's surprising to you to learn that documentaries are manipulative and biased like it was honestly for me, then the problem is you and me. We expect our documentarians to be honest, but they're not. And according to their medium, they don't have to be. So what makes them dangerous isn't the way they're presented, it's the way that we watch them. We expect the medium of documentaries to be truthful when there is no requirement for that whatsoever. We watch YouTube and documentaries like we're watching something that's absolutely true when that couldn't be further from reality. I know you probably thought this episode was going to end with me bashing Shane, because I oftentimes frame the episodes that way. But the truth is what he's doing is smart. Not just from a YouTube programming perspective, but from a cultural relevancy standpoint. The real takeaway from this episode and this whole Jake Paul series, set of theories, docu-theory, <laughs> I like that, is this. Don't accept everything you see as fact. And don't expect people on YouTube to be truthful or unbiased. Even your absolutely favorite creators. I can tell you that most of us us try to be as honest as possible when we're making videos, but everyone, everyone has some kind of agenda, and critical thinking is the only thing that stands between you and being taken in. Don't be someone who passively accepts what you're told, whether it's to buy tickets to a 19-year-old's YouTube convention or buying a t-shirt from someone who's dabbing on their haters. If you think about it, or you don't have to think about it, I'm just going to explicitly tell you, this whole issue is the entire reason that film theory and game theory exist as channels. I learned early on to think critically about the stories I'm being told and the underlying motivations that exist for why people might be telling me those stories. And that led me to do shows that look at things from a different angle, that asks the question, maybe they're lying to us. If I can pull back the curtain and inspire critical thinking in some of you who watch too, encouraging you to keep on asking questions, well then, I'm doing my job. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And back to normal stuff later this week, because I know a lot of you people are like, where are the actual films and the actual films? theories. Oh, but lastly, for God's sake, Shane, don't make the next one a 13-part series. Though, if you're looking for some good expose material, I've seen you tweeting a lot about Defy's MCN closing. As someone who was a Defy employee and was in their network when the company collapsed and has worked in a lot of different capacities across the multi-channel network universe, I have plenty of fun stories to tell ya.